you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 36. If you're flying somewhere this summer or even in the year to come, I think you'll find our chat today about airline wines uplifting. I'm going to cover which wines are best to drink when you're 30,000 feet in the air, how your sense of smell and taste change, and why airlines are paying more attention to their wine selections on board these days. Now, before we dive in, I'd love your help in spreading the word about this podcast. Please take a moment to post a review on Apple Podcasts, formerly iTunes, or on social media. If you do that, let me know and I'll give you a shout out on this podcast. Plus, if you do, I'll send you a free copy of my Ultimate Food and Wine Pairing Guide. It's a quick template covering the major food matches for red, white, rosé, and dessert wines. It's visually very appealing, and I know you'll get tons of use from it. All you have to do is post a review on Apple Podcasts or on social media. Then just email me, natalie at nataliemcclain.com, and I'll send it to you. All right, on with the show. Enjoy. My dream flight begins with the wine selection. Quote, We'd like to direct your attention to the wine list in the seat pocket in front of you says the airline attendant. You'll note that we have a fine selection of first-growth Bordeaux at the rear of the plane, and now he's using that double-arm, two-finger signal, and a 40-year vintage of port is being decanted in the middle aisles, now pointing that way, usually where the emergency exits are, and for our first-class passengers, we have a vertical of Chateau Cam 1945 through 1960, at the front of the plane. At any time during this flight, should you run out of wine, it is imperative that you help yourself first before assisting other passengers. This will help reduce overall cabin pressure, not to mention the stress of your post-merger flight crew. We realize that you no longer have a choice of airlines, but drink up, and we're sure that you'll forget all of those terminal delays and lost luggage that can really annoy anyone sober. End quote. So perhaps my silver-winged sybaritic dream is a stretch, but airline wine is one aspect of flying that's no longer a pot shot target. In fact, wine lists have improved, fueled by more savvy customers in a fiercely competitive worldwide industry. Airlines often have the same equipment, routes, fares, frequent flyer programs, so food and wine are now one of the few ways to express individuality. That's why there are more premium brands on board, including Starbucks coffee, Godiva chocolates, Ben & Jerry ice cream, and meals created by celebrity chefs. Indeed, British Airways research shows that the closer we get to flying, the more important food and wine become. When we're booking our ticket, it's only the sixth most important factor. However, when we're standing in line at the gate to board, it's number two, after the attitude of the flight crew. But let's not kid ourselves about anyone choosing an airline because of the wine, as in, ticket agent, that'll be $3,456 for the wine, plus we'll throw in a free return trip to California. But that said, we're no longer happy to drink a $6 bottle that devours 0.001% of our fare. Ten years ago, that wasn't uncommon. Wine selection was based mostly on price, and often the same wine was served year after year, even in bad vintages. You could choose from one undrinkable French white wine 
or one undrinkable French red wine. <laughs> it was cheap and nasty. But most of us want something pleasantly palatable to release the tension of running late to the gate with a 30-pound shoulder bag and high heels, or to forget about the big guy snoring next to us who has just rolled his head onto our shoulder. Getting a wine to taste delicious at 30,000 feet isn't easy. After a few hours, we get dehydrated. Alcohol's dehydrating effect compounds this, and we lose up to 30% of our ability to taste. Wine's aromas are flattened, and any element that's out of balance, such as tannin or acidity, is emphasized. The wine hasn't changed. We have. British Airways once invited several wine writers to blind taste a group of wines at Heathrow Airport, more wines when flying aboard the Concorde to Barbados, and then another set of wines once they were in a hotel in Barbados, where the poor souls had completed their grueling day. They unanimously judged the best wines were those that they tasted in Barbados, followed by those at the Heathrow Airport, and then finally those tasted while flying. Turns out, of course, the same wines were served at all three tastings. Before the wine even gets on board, it has to survive a labyrinthine of logistics of thousands of flights and destinations. Ken Chase, who has consulted with Delta Airlines, admits to doing some pretty strange things with wine, such as heating, chilling, and shaking it, to ensure that the wine can withstand cooking on the tarmac in Mexico or being rickshawed through bumpy streets in Bangkok. Will the wine still perform in your glass after it's been rerouted through Iceland? Fortunately, most airlines have a network now of temperature-controlled warehouses where they build the bar carts. British Airways, for example, has 60 bar-building stations around the world. But then there are the impoverished tools of airline wine service. Proper stemware and crystal decanters are out of the question, given storage constraints and glass breakage, leaving us with those little plastic pill cups. Both British Airways and United Airlines are developing specially designed tasting glasses with shorter stems and better shaped to concentrate the aromas. To compensate for pressurized cabins, British Airways has also created its own blend of champagne that's bottled at a lower pressure. But that still leaves cramped quarters and turbulence. Would you like a little more claret on your shirt, sir? The other part of wine service is the server. It's kind of reassuring to know that wine training is rather low on the priority list for flight crew given the situations that they face. I mean, would you really want them distracting hijackers with over-oaked Chardonnays? However, most airlines squeeze in a few hours on wine training. Beyond that, they use in-flight wine guides with tasting notes, pronunciations, and food matches. British Airways further encourages staff to seek outside training by paying for wine courses. Over a thousand of their attendants who have passed a sommelier exam wear a lapel pin indicating that they can answer passengers' wine questions. The most rigorous training is Delta's in-house Venom Wine Academy, a seven-day course covering food and wine that runs from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Working with these constraints, airline buyers tend to look for fat, fruit-forward, bold wines from Australia, southern France, Chile, and California, rather than delicate or older wines. Aside from being reasonably priced, these wines have to be available in massive quantities. United buys 400,000 cases annually, while Air Canada purchases about 60,000 cases. To make their final selections, some airlines feature the wines made in their home country, while others offer route-specific choices to passengers so that they can get a taste of the destination when they board the plane. Air Canada, for example, does serve Canadian wines in flight across the country, but serves red and white kosher wines en route to Tel Aviv, sake while flying to Asian destinations, and so on. Many airlines use an outside tasting panel to make their final choices. The Enological Literati advises British Airways 
Hugh Johnson, Michael Broadbent, and Jancis Robinson, the latter of whom says or writes in her memoir that after gushing about being invited to participate on such an august panel, she received the deflating explanation from the British Airways rep, quote, well, we thought we needed a woman, end quote. Robinson also writes that the panel has the smudging effect of eliminating distinctive wine, given that someone in the group is likely not to like an extreme style. This drags wine choices into the, quote, innocuous middle ground of communal assessment, end quote, to please everyone, which is ideal for airlines, but not so much for wine lovers who are better off following one critic they trust. Of course, the most distinctive wine is served in business and first class. The creme de la creme used to be British Airways' Concord Cellar, which consisted of mature Cru Classé Red Bordeaux, Grand and Premier Cru White and White, Grand and Premier Cru Red and White Burgundy, and a Cuvée Champagne. The cellar held 10 years of selections for aging. Benchmark wines filled the list, such as Krug, Heidsick, Paul Roger, and Dom Perignon, the latter of which the airline used to be the single largest buyer in the world. The airline also featured the best of the New World regions, such as Penfold's Grange, Opus One, and Kistler. When the Concorde took its last flight in 2003, wine lovers around the world shed a few tears. Well, at least the rich ones did. To recognize excellence in airline wine lists, Business Traveler magazine sponsors an annual competition called Cellars in the Sky. When Finnair won, it was spending two-thirds of its wine budget on business class, which still only accounts for about 4% of a business class ticket. The airline stocks an average of 600 different labels in its cellars. For wineries, Getting on airline lists not only means revenues that don't eat into ground sales, it's also an international sampling program. Australian winemaker Wolf Blass recognized that promotion potential early on and held wine tasting sessions with captive first-class audiences whenever he flew. He was also known to have himself paged frequently in airport lounges so that his name, Wolf Blass, was top of mind with duty-free shoppers. Even with lots of changes, we still aren't exactly in the golden age of airline wine. But we can expect to see the quality continue to improve with less conservative choices. British Airways, for example, is experimenting with organic wines, Alsatian Rieslings, Romanian Reds, and Austrian Pinot Blanc. Many airlines also plan to package more information with their wines. This may mean watching a short video on the wines being served, perhaps an expert tasting session, which, yeah, gives new meaning to flights of wine, or a travel piece on the region where the wines are featured. This may also extend into interactive web-based sessions where passengers can explore information on the wines as deeply as they desire. Delta already includes its wine list on its site, and in its wine guide reviews several wine websites for cyber sipping. If you want great wine these days, You don't have to fly thousands of miles to get it. You can sip it en route. Now, if only they could fix the stuff that can really ruin a good glass of Pinot Noir. All right, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please tell someone about this podcast, especially someone who might like to learn about airline wines. It's easy to find on Google. You can search for the podcast name, Unreserved Wine Talk, or on my name. Did you know that you can now listen to this podcast on your speaker? Just say, hey, Google, or for Amazon's Echo, we'll use Madam A, so it won't set off your device and mine. Say, Madam A, play Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'd love to chat with you about wine while you're playing solitaire, waiting for your facial mask to dry, or macrameing a new lampshade. It's always wine time. You'll find links to the airline wine lists that I mentioned in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 36, as well as links to my favorite wines to drink when I'm flying. What was your favorite tip or quote from this episode? Share that with me on Twitter or Facebook and tag me at Natalie McLean. On Instagram, I'm at Natalie McLean Wine. 
Finally, if you want to take your ability to pair wine and food to the next level, join me in a free online video class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash class. I can't wait to share more wine stories with you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this one. I hope something great is in your glass this week and whenever you fly. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.